It's 1915 in Japanese-occupied Korea, and a woman is telling part of her life story of how her mother passed away when she was young and how she and her three sisters became beggars as a result because their father's grief led him to alcoholism. She says that at one point she was married off to a social outcast, a man with a cleft lip and a limp, but that her husband was kind to her. She feels, though, that her family is cursed because she gave birth to three sons, none of whom lived to see their first birthday. So she's there to ask the older lady to lift the curse and they start performing a ritual. By the way, the woman is pregnant at this time and the older woman tells her that she will have a daughter who will thrive. She does end up giving birth to a healthy looking baby girl. Meanwhile, in New York in 1989, Solomon is being passed over for a promotion to vice president of the company. Even though the company has been giving him the impression that he's going to get it and he's been an excellent employee, instrumental in bringing in big business for the firm. He's about to be dismissed told that he'll have to wait another year for his promotion when he offers to close a deal with a Korean landowner who lives in Japan who has been refusing to sell a piece of land that the company desperately wants. This is a big deal and nobody has been able to convince her to sell and Solomon says that he will. He is Korean after all, so he feels he might be able to connect with her and in exchange, he would like the VP position and a bonus. We get to see Sunja then, the woman's daughter as a young girl, and she's incredibly close with her father and her mother rather affectionately thinks that he dotes on her too much. So the family runs or owns a boarding house and one of the fishermen who lives there expresses his hatred and his desire to kill the Japanese soldiers. Remember, they're living under Japanese occupation, so they aren't free in their own country. Soon after, the soldiers appear at the home and they question Sunja's father about the man's whereabouts because he's suddenly disappeared and Sunja's father should have actually reported this. It's known obviously that the fisherman was speaking badly of the Japanese and this appears to be something akin to a crime. Of course Sinja's father knows nothing but we do see in a scene that Sinja had gone to the fisherman and warned him to leave because his drunk ramblings could put her whole family at risk. Eventually the fisherman is found and he's brought bound to the town square. The soldiers start beating him up trying to break him but he keeps singing it's implied that he is beaten to death and it seems like it would be the first in many losses that Sinju will experience throughout her life. Later in the episode, we also see her and her mother caring for her father who appears to have tuberculosis and she witnesses his death with her name being the last word that her father utters. Solomon arrives in Osaka and he sees his father, then he goes to visit his gran. There's a photo on the piano at his gran's house of a young Sunja and her father. So Sunja is Solomon's grandmother. Solomon also goes to the company office in Tokyo, which is where he's mostly based for work during his stay. In the young Sunja storyline, meanwhile, it's nine years later and Sunja catches the eye of a rather powerful man in a white suit and their eyes meet. He is the new fish broker at the market docks and his name is Ko Hansu. In episode two, some of the local fishermen, dock workers and market people talk about what a bad man Ko Hansu is and that he works for some bad Japanese men. Could be the Yakuza, but that's never really confirmed. Sanju is sitting there silent, but she hears all of this. When she reaches the docks, she sees him manhandling the fisherman. He's rather cruel, but he appears to still intrigue her, even as he walks off with another girl. In the present day, in 1989, we see that Sunja cares for Kyungji, her sister-in-law, who is bedridden. They have a very close relationship, but Kyungji looks tired of fighting her sickness. She doesn't want to eat. She doesn't want to take her pills. She's not combative just tired as Sunja tries to get her to eat. Kyunji asks Sunja then what her life would have been like had she chosen differently and she asks Sunja whether she still thinks about that man. Back in time at the market when Sunja is a young woman, she's on her way to the ferry when she gets accosted by a group of Japanese speaking men and they drag her as she screams and tries to fight into an empty room. Just then the broker comes to her rescue makes the boys apologize, threatens to kill them if they bother Sunja again, and he accompanies her to the ferry and on her ride. This is when they start spending time together. He keeps her company as she does her laundry down by the river, and he even does it with her, helping her. You get the sense that he does care for her, and he has feelings for her, but he's still not altogether trustworthy. And one day, they finally sleep together in the forest. Solomon, meanwhile, goes to talk to the woman who is holding up the sale, and he ups the offer to one billion yen. She acknowledges that this is a life-changing amount of money, but this isn't about money for her. It never has been. Back at the office, Solomon gets a call from someone named Hannah, 
a childhood friend from, it seems to be, the time just before Solomon left for the States. He wants to find her and reconnect with her, but she tells him that he wouldn't be able to. She's in a dark place and she can't find her way out. He also tells her then that her mother, Itsuko, who is with Solomon's father, is looking for her. In fact, Itsuko hired a PI to track her down, but her husband tells her that she was last seen eight months ago in Tokyo, working at a soap land. Apparently, she had many clients. Now, I didn't know what this meant. Was she a sex worker? And when I looked it up, yes, a soap land is a kind of brothel. In episode three, Sunja looks really tired as she's doing her chores and I'm nervous for her. Boki reminds her, that she also missed her period the previous month. She then hears from one of the fishermen from the market that Kohan Su is away and even though he's meant to be due back soon, she's told that a man like him has options so he may never return. He does return though and they're happily reunited and that's when she tells him that she's with child. He's glad and he embraces her, which is a relief, but when she asks about marriage plans, he tells her that he already has a family in Osaka so he can't marry her. His marriage is more of an arranged marriage than a love match, he says, but he will still look after Sun and make sure that their child has everything. She's visibly heartbroken by this and he suddenly turns on her, asking in an accusatory way whether this was her plan all along to trap him in a marriage and he cruelly wonders out loud whether she wants to burden him and their child with her father's so-called curse. She runs off then heartbroken. Later a man arrives at the dock looking for Sunja's family home. He's really sick though and when he finally makes it he collapses in their front yard and they find out that his name is Isaac and Sunja's mother decides to nurse him back to health. In the present day Sunja goes to give her sister-in-law Kyungi her breakfast and sees that she has passed away in her sleep. After an emotional few funeral service for her, Solomon asks his gran if she can come to Tokyo with him to talk to the landowner lady. Perhaps his gran might convince her to sell. The lady and gran get to talking and the lady tells her that she finally gets to go to school, something she wasn't able to do when she was younger. She's just finished grade six. They talk and actually connect as older Korean women living in Japan, missing their home. The woman still doesn't like Solomon or trust him. She makes it clear she knows what he was trying to do by bringing his gran around. But later at the office, Solomon gets the news that she has agreed to sell. Hannah calls Solomon again at the office and he hears her coughing. She's sick, but their phone call gets cut short by Solomon's boss who wants them to join in on the celebrations. Sunja finally tells her mother that she's pregnant. Her mother was worried about what this will mean for her. Having an illegitimate child and no husband means she'll be shunned and she's disappointed, worried, but also supportive of her daughter and they cry together. Isaac is up and about and he needs to send a cable in town so Sunja's mother has her walk him there and he offers to buy her lunch in return. Kohan Su does spot them at the docks. While they're having lunch, Isaac tells her that he knows that she with child. He asks if she'd consider giving the child to a family, a childless couple perhaps. In one of many profoundly beautiful and heartbreaking scenes, she tells him that she knows of the impossibility of her situation, but she thinks of her father a lot now and how for him, she was meant to be impossible too. And yet here she is. She'll do what it takes to love and care for her child, whether she's ostracized from society, whether she has to work until her nails break. She says that this was a promise that her father made to her when she was born and she'll be there for her unborn child. Isaac is deeply touched and realized that he misjudged her and he apologizes to her. He tells her he's aware that she's carrying another man's child and he asks whether she thinks she'll ever be able to move on from Kohan Tzu. Could she maybe one day when she's ready come to care for someone else? Sanju knows what he's saying and she's touched but taken aback. She nods though that someday maybe she could care for someone else. In the present day meanwhile Sanju tells Solomon that she wants to bury Kyunji's ashes in Korea. Earlier in the episode she did say that, that it was a great sadness that Kyunji always wanted to go back home and it had just become too late for her. Sunja feels that her final resting place should be at home and that was the first three episodes of Pachinko. I fell in love with the show minutes into the intro. It's visually stunning, the score is perfect, the actors are superb, it just all makes for a deeply moving and beautiful show that somehow left my heart both broken yet full at the same time. I would highly recommend this. I just got the book as well because I have a feeling that I won't be done with the story after the show and I want to save that as a treat. Anyway, definitely going to carry on streaming this. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching.